All right, everyone. Welcome back to another snowy Atlanta. This is uh, December 17th today. Mm -hmm. We're a bit snowbound in the south. Had some uh, frigid cold weather. Mm -hmm. But we're back here with Sir Anthony. And uh, before we start, as usual, let's see. Um, you can go to our... Okay, we have the humanjesus.org website. Uh, new articles for this month are already up. Um, one by our friend Etienne Kernau. In uh, France, are there any Trinitarians to be found in the New Testament? Uh, something on the uh, word or the logos. And a quote from Karl Rotter and his Christology. And as usual, this is our ministry website, focusonthekingdom.org. If you have any other topics, uh, we usually cover, uh, we, we usually repeat ourselves, I should say, a lot because <laughs> questions, I, get, I guess, get recycled. But up here, I just wanna show you, if you have any topic uh, that you wanna look at, mm -hmm. um, you search. just yep search there like sabbath mm -hmm. you press enter and you should get something like this you scroll down and there you go mm -hmm. so you can do that as well so everyone listening on zoom you can type your question in the chat box if you don't see it just click on chat you can type it there or alternatively you can click on the, there should be a raise hand button if you want to interact with Sir Anthony and myself live. And for those on uh, Anthony's Facebook page, uh, you can only, I guess, leave your comment there. If you, if you have any questions, just try and keep them short mm -hmm. and succinct. Okay, Sir Anthony, you want to start us off with uh, some words first? Uh, yes. Let us think of simplicity. If you're asking a very complicated question or thinking of very complicated answers, you're almost certainly wrong. The Bible was written for ordinary folks. It was not meant to be a book to be argued about. Tragically, we have so failed in our attempts to make sense of Scripture, and there are good reasons for that. We abandoned the Shema early on. The greatest of all commandments, Jesus said, is that God is one single person. Alas, the church fathers threw that away. And they admitted that they did. That was a disaster from which we've not yet recovered. And this, this then leads to all the complications which now beset us. So let's keep this very simple. God is one. The gospel is about the kingdom of God. Jesus is the Lord Messiah, not the Lord God. You cannot have two gods. Paul did not have software on his computer. That's silly. We all know that the Brits sing God Save the Queen when they honor the Queen. They don't sing the American national anthem. These are self-evident things if you have a little history. If you don't have history, then get some good history books and study the history of thought, and it will all become clear. So let's keep it simple. Let's keep it practical. And by all means, you who are listening must share the information when you've proven it to be true. You must be active in the Great Commission. That is the issue. Right. Okay. So... Usually in our church meetings, by the way, uh, if you're looking for fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, go back to the same focus on the kingdom.org. If you're uh, an isolated, like-minded believer, yeah, like ourselves, just go here, focus on the kingdom.org, and all you do is click up here, live streaming, mm -hmm. and Sir Anthony does his sermons yep. uh, there at uh, 10 a.m., Oops, sorry, let me bring that up again. 10.30 mm -hmm. a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's EST, Eastern Standard Time. If you're, We have many uh, friends, brothers and sisters in um, uh, Europe, for example, in Australia. So make sure you get that time correct. 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And mm -hmm. this box here is a chat box. It's uh, disabled right now. And this is the video box, and you can inter interact with us. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the Shema, you want to say something about, so we're biblical Unitarians yes. and the Shema is paramount. The Shema is paramount. You should know that the Shema is the Deuteronomy 6, 4, the creed for which Jews and Jesus and ideally Christians, in fact, necessarily Christians should die. It is the definition of who God is. Most people don't know what the Shema is. They're not having it preached. That needs to be changed. You can change it. Write to the newspaper. The Shema is the hero Israel. Pay attention. Israel, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and quoted and approved as the greatest commandment by Jesus. So here's the point. If you want to write to your friends, write to the newspaper, you say something like this. You warm the subject up a little bit by saying, Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Is that clear? If you love Jesus, you're going to obey his words. That should be clear. Okay, then. Will you please kind t kindly tell me what is meant by the great commandment? Everybody believes in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Supper, the Great Commission, all those things. What about the great creed commandment of Jesus in Mark 12, 29? You could spend the rest of your lives this side of the second coming dealing with this point. What is Jesus' definition of the one God? Why do we talk about the Apostles' Creed all the time? Nothing much wrong with the Apostles' Creed, but that's the Apostles. Why not go to the Apostle singular, Jesus the Apostle? What about his creed? I'm trying to put Jesus back into the system because he's been tragically neglected. So you simply ask your friends, is that creed in Mark 12, 29, a unitary monotheistic creed? Or is it a Trinitarian creed? Which is it? Don't let them budge, fudge, dodge. Simply answer that question. It's a very clever question in the sense that it forces people to think through this. If they say it's a Trinitarian creed, they're simply demonstrating they know nothing whatsoever about the history of thought. Jews were never Trinitarians. That's absurd. If they say it's a unitary monotheistic creed, you want to avoid you may want to avoid the word Unitarian. It's a good word, but it has other connotations. So call it Unitary, unipersonal uh, monotheism. Is it that? If they say it is, you say, why are you not following Jesus at the Great Commandment? Then when that has uh, passed as a very interesting piece of conversation, you then say, tell me, which of the 11,550 references to God in the Bible ever means a triune God. You won't find one. Then if you're not able to show me, would you admit then that in the Bible, when somebody says God, Adonai, Theos, Elohim, Yahweh, etc., when they say God, they never, ever mean a triune God. That will help people to see that something went wrong early on to shift the meaning of the word God. This is very serious business. You cannot change the meaning of the word God without really disturbing the Bible big time. And don't forget the Muslims and the Jews are aghast at the Trinity. So what we're talking about here is simply huge in the sense that it affects millions of human beings struggling to make a good relationship with God. That's my point. Right, and uh, just quickly before we get to the questions, so what we usually do folks is we go through questions we get during the week or weeks. And then if time permitting, uh, we can take any questions live or written. And uh, before we move on, Anthony, from the Shema, I just want to share, um, I've been doing a lot of uh, a study on the, the Shema during the uh, Inquisition. Yep. And uh, this popped up in my research, uh, uh -huh. Jewish Martyrs in the Pagan and Christian Worlds. On page 90, 92, the importance of reciting the Shema was conceived as a reaction to the Christian belief in the coexisting authority of God and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the future, martyrdom will, end, will center on this verse, known in short as the proclamation of the Shema. So it's talking obviously in relation to the Jews. Yep. It will become the equivalent of the Christian martyrs' proclamation, Christianus Sum, mm -hmm. or I, I am a Christian. Christian. Yes. Now, what's interesting in this quote, Anthony, as you can see, is the division of mm -hmm. Jewish and Christian creeds. Mm -hmm. Never should be. Because the writer, I am sure in the back of their mind, uh, the writer is Shum, 
Shemuel. Yeah, Shemuel. Uh, Shemuel, which, Hebrew name, Samuel is. Who's, who's, Shepkaru. who's probably, uh, yeah, yeah, a Jew. Oh, in, yeah. his, in the back of his mind, I'm sure, when he's talking about Christian belief, mm -hmm. it's obviously the Trinity. Yes. So this is an unfortunate thing that has happened that the, uh, the Jewish Christian creed of the Shema mm. has been in a way hijacked, lost, mm. because of this concept of God and Jesus as somehow being one and the same. So that's an interesting bit that's of history yeah. there. It's the question, and if you would report back to us kindly by email or on some of these sessions, as to what reaction you get from the pastor when you say, tell me about the creed of Jesus. I want to know, is that a Trinitarian or a Unitarian creed? Please answer. It will expose the appalling fact that in churches, Jesus actually would be rejected. That happened when the church fathers said, and they admitted this, the church fathers so-called, who really were influenced by paganism more than they realized, nevertheless admitted they didn't like the Shema. We don't like that Jewish creed. We don't like the pagan creed either. So we'll give you, as the established creed, something between the two, a mix of paganism and the Jewish creed, which we reject. They say that. You see, all liars eventually give themselves away by admitting the lie, and the church fathers admitted this. And you ought to be up in arms and saying, I'm standing for Jesus. I'm insisting on the creed that Jesus affirmed in Mark 12, 29, which is a Unitarian, non-Trinitarian creed. Jesus never claimed to be God, absolutely unimaginable. He claimed to be the Son of God, unique agent of God. All that's clear, but never ever said, I am Yahweh. That's absurd. Never ever said, I am God. John 58 is nothing whatsoever to do with saying, I am God. It is a patent falsehood to say that in John 8, 58, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. That's just a mistranslation. It should be rendered, I am he. How do I know that? Because in the first occurrence of that I am he statement, in John 4, the meaning is obviously, I'm the Messiah. Whole point of the Bible is lost if you create two gods out of one, and if you miss the fact that Jesus is the human Messiah, the man Messiah, none of this is difficult or complicated until you depart from the creed of Jesus. And you then back your, your conversation up with Psalm 110.1, vastly underestimated psalm, actually the most favorite verse in the New Testament by far from the old. And that second Lord there is grossly mistranslated in probably in your translation, should not have a capital L on there. The story there is about Yahweh, the one God, one single person. There's only one person who is God, Yahweh, the Father. No matter how you pronounce it, Yehovah, if you like, Yahweh is fine. The Lord God is sending an oracle to Adoni. I want you to go through every occurrence of Adoni to convince yourself. 195 times, Strong's Concordance may not do it for you because it's hiding. You will need something better than Strong's Concordance. You're going to have to read the Hebrew, learn the Hebrew, look up the Hebrews, ask the rabbi. You'll find that in every single occurrence of the word Adoni, I didn't say Adonai, I said Adoni, it means non-deity. Therefore, Psalm 110.1 plainly says that Yahweh speaks to non-deity. God speaks to non-deity. That's exactly what Luke 2.11 says, and you won't go find your Bible studies before you show them this, that the one born in Bethlehem that day, when the angels are rejoicing, the shepherds are being told of the birth certificate of this person. Who is he? God? No. God doesn't get born in the Bible. That's ridiculous. The one born is the Messiah Lord. The Christos Kyrios, the Messiah Lord. There are two lords. One is God, one is the Messiah. Only one of them is God. The other is a supremely elevated, now immortalized human being. You're going to have your work cut out to get the world to see this, but these are easy facts. All right. Good evening from Carrollton, says one of our viewers. Hello, Bob and Kay. I hope you're hey. all feeling well. Keeping warm, I hope. All right. We'll <laughs> jump right in here, Anthony. Let's see, when Paul writes to Timothy that all scripture is inspired, hmm. what does he mean? Uh, I'll just quickly share the passage in question here, Anthony. Hmm. Uh, if I can find it here. Oh. Second Timothy 3, all scripture yeah. is breathed out 
by God. This is the ESV, and this is Bible Gateway. Uh, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every yeah. good work. So what does uh, all scripture is... Well, it means exactly what it says. All scripture <laughs> is inspired. God breathed. It is inspired in the sense that the writers of scripture were under the inspiration of God when they wrote scripture. You cannot play chess without a chessboard. You cannot play soccer with no white lines down the side. You cannot begin to talk about faith or religion at all unless there's a standard. Jesus whom we re believe God raised from the dead and therefore approved of him very, very much, Jesus worked out of Scripture. He didn't have to argue the point. He simply said, it is written. Scripture says, if you won't believe what Moses said, you're not going to believe what I say, Jesus said. Scripture is a given for him. Just like the, the national anthem in England is a given. It's God save the Queen. We know that Buckingham Palace is not on the Isle of Wight. These are self-evident truths and should never even be debated. They're so obvious. All scripture is God breathed. God breathed it out. Jesus defined Old Testament scripture plainly in a verse that you're going to have to use all the time, Luke 24, 44, where Jesus said, everything in the law, the prophets, and the writings, that's the threefold division of the Hebrew Bible that you now still have, that is scripture. That's fixed datum. Nothing to argue about. If you haven't got that, you might as well go and do something more useful because there's no faith to be talked about. Jude said, the half-brother of Jesus said in Jude 3, we are to contend. That's a strong word. You are to fight daily, struggle for, insist upon the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. If you can't define that, it's a completely pointless statement, has no meaning at all. So get busy, work on the law, prophets, and the writings, recognize that Paul is taken to be scripture in the New Testament. You must have scripture to have anything at all to say about what is true. Uh, since we're on this topic, Anthony, could you mm. talk a bit about, we, we sometimes get questions about why is in this book or why is in that book uh, mm. in, the, in our Bibles, for example, some of the Catholic books like the Maccabeans mm. or some of the extra biblical Jewish works like uh, the book of Enoch, which is mm. prominent in the um, prophecy of the Old and New Testament. Uh, could you comment? Well, yes, it's canon? not for you to decide that. That's not, the, not, not your business. The canon of scripture is given. As a matter of fact, those other books are not cited directly in the Bible, you could argue that part of Enoch is. That's true. That part of Enoch, which is quoted by Jude and referred to by Peter, is inscripturated. It's come, become part of Scripture. It's none of your business. Don't even go there. If you haven't got a canon, you are floundering in darkness. You have nothing to say. It would be better to keep quiet and say nothing. The canon of Scripture has been given you. Jesus affirmed that for the Old Testament. And it follows logically that you cannot have the New Testament canon without starting at Matthew and ending with Revelation. If that's not it, then do something more useful. You're wasting your time. All right. Next question here. Moving along, we got a lot of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you comment on uh, open theism, positives, oh, yeah. negatives of the doctrine? Uh, just before you answer, mm -hmm. open theism is... Uh, actually, can you first define what open theism is? Yes, open theism. Again, do not make this too complicated. Open theism is the notion that God sometimes chooses not to know something. He waits to see what human beings are doing. I find that perfectly acceptable. God, as you know, repented that he'd made man. He changed his mind. He actually was very pained by what he saw. So then, he didn't know the degree of wickedness. That's because he gave man some free will within limits, of course. That should be obvious. This now, is... God is not a man that he can repent. There, the word repent is being used in a different sense, obviously. God is not a, a, a flippant man, indecisive, who changes his mind all the time. However, there are situations in which it says that God changed his mind. In, uh, is it Jeremiah? I think the book of Jeremiah you have this statement, that if God warns a nation 
of impending trouble, punishment, and that nation changes its mind, then God relents. In Jonah, you know, they actually did repent and God did not carry out the threat. He changed his mind. I don't know why that's in any way difficult. Don't make it difficult. Some people get terribly bent out of shape over this, quite unnecessarily. Obviously, God does not repent in a, a sloppy way as we do. Sometimes we just change our mind. But there are passages where God said to Abraham, for example, now I see that you're willing to offer your son. That implies I didn't see that till I tested you. Why not? If God chooses not to know, he doesn't know. That's all right. You're not God. You don't make the rules. God makes the rules, reveals his will. There's also the one where he said he regretted making Saul king. I get that. He repented of that. He watched Saul, and he was very disappointed in what Saul had done. That, I think, is in 1 Samuel 15. So there are numbers of cases here. Yeah, I don't can find I, this um, in any way difficult. Can I what share, uh, since yeah. we're going, no you're shooting through the... Uh, passages mm -hmm. yep. let me let me give one clear example with a passage uh so people can look it up for themselves yep. uh, this is first kings 22 uh the lord and that's all caps mm -hmm. so it's yahweh we know, we know it's jehovah or mm -hmm. yahweh mm -hmm. uh the lord god said who will entice ahab to go up and fall at ramoth mm -hmm. iliad mm -hmm. and one said this while another said that mm -hmm. Then a spirit came forward and stood before God, the Lord, and said, I will entice him. Mm -hmm. Then God said, how? Mm -hmm. So God is asking, mm -hmm. how? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Yep. Then he said, that is God. You are yes. to entice him then and also prevail. Go yep. and do so. Fine. No problem. I find that not in any way difficult. It's a matter of simple belief of the text of scripture the other one was in first samuel i think 15 wasn't it but god regretted having made so uh, king yep. good one first samuel uh, let's see regretted yep yep i can look those up the lord yeah mm -hmm. it's it's here somewhere yep i regret uh first samuel 15 mm -hmm. 10 the word of the lord once again all caps Yep. Came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, mm -hmm. for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments, implying that God didn't know that this was That's going right. to happen. That's reasonable. That's entirely reasonable. If you're God, you make the rules, and if you choose not to know, you don't know. That's not so hard. We have to allow Scripture to speak to us and not argue with it. This does not mean that nothing is fixed in God's plan. That's an extreme opposite view. The second coming is not an option. It will happen. There are areas of decision where God waits to see what is coming. That's fine, but they are strictly limited. It doesn't mean that God doesn't know what he's going to do in, in the bigger plan. He certainly does. So, so the... Um the flip side to this, if you mm. don't hold to, because the questioner wants to know the positives and the negatives. So mm. the positive is obviously that we just believe the text mm. and yes. just say, well, God chose not to know certain sure. things. Yes. Um, That's it. The negative is not the, to believe the text. Exactly right. The positive right. is to believe what the Bible says there. Yes. But in the mind of our uh, friends mm. who are not for that, Mm -hmm. They're not for open theism because mm -hmm. then they say, well, then you're implying that God is not omniscient. Mm -hmm. God is not all-knowing. How would you? Well, God is what? not knowing what he says he doesn't know. He doesn't know. Live with it. Mm -hmm. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question of believing the text of Scripture. Right. So that's what we simply yeah, say. Uh, otherwise, read the book otherwise, it's a situation like Mark... 1332 mm. yes then we make god to be a liar because many people say mm. uh mm. that jesus in mark 1332 mm. he says that that he doesn't know he clearly says i don't jesus know the did. day or the hour of only course. the father knows yes. that's right and people who believe jesus is literally the god the almighty god <laughs> then turn around and they have to make it complicated mm. and say, well, you know, he really did know, but he wasn't really telling us. I wouldn't go there. Well, this is the Absolutely. same situation with God. It you, is. You would have to, 
if you don't hold to some kind of open theism, mm. then God really does know, but yeah. he's really not telling. And that sounds like lying to me. It, absolutely. I wouldn't go there. I would ch treat the text as a child and believe it and get on with it. All right. Yes. We'll move on Wonderful. here. Anthony. Mm. Okay. I know there should be elders not mm. too young for the sake of pride. Mm -hmm. But what about Timothy? Uh, Timothy. Mm. Uh, we're just talking about Timothy. According to Paul, he was a youth and a pastor raising up yes. other pastors. Of course. Well, he's an exception. I mean, this is extraordinary sort of ironing everything out flat. Obviously, the tendency is for a younger person not to be able to handle that leadership. Well, in the case of Timothy, he was, had risen above that. I have no problem with that. Paul ordained him. He did very well. And he was under the mentorship of Paul, of course. As a general rule, you might want, want to be more careful about ordaining people too young. But that's not difficult. I don't see what the difficulty is there. Right, and uh, the requirements set out in First Timothy 3, uh, yes. Titus uh, 1, I believe. Mm. And um, yeah, the, yes. the requisites there, the requirements, yes. I should say. Now, it's ideal that they're married, but Paul himself was not married. You don't have to be married to be an elder, pastor, leader. You don't have to be. It's perhaps to your advantage if you are, but there are bachelor uh, pastors in the Bible, and Paul himself was not married, as we know. So relax a little bit. This is a certain legalistic, fussy mind that attends a lot of Bible study. I would say get over there. Be more reasonable and more liberal in the best sense. Don't Since pick endlessly over issues that are not really tricky. They're not difficult until you make them difficult. Uh, one that has been made difficult in regards mm -hmm. to this, Anthony, mm -hmm. is the uh, one of the requirements here is that the overseer elder mm. is the husband of one wife. Yes, of course. Want to comment on that, Bruce? Well, of course. I, I just didn't mention that, I think. That's the ideal situation. Paul was not excluding himself from eldership. If he's married, that is, he's to be securely married. That's the point. If he's not married, then... Paul actually says it was an advantage at that stage not to be married. So was he then excluding all married men from eldership? Of course not. Again, I, relax. I meant be broad-minded. I meant him uh, more in terms of excluding women. Oh, Paul, I think, would not burden the women with where the buck stops. That's so you don't agree issue. with ordaining women? Paul would not have ordained women because he was too kind to them. He didn't want them to have to bear the responsibility of telling the men what to do. The elder has more authority in Scripture. That's an elder, overseer, bishop, presbyter. That's all the same rank. He has to, do, to be responsible for the crowd, and he has to tell them what to do. Obey your leaders, Paul said, or the writer of Hebrews said, obey your leaders because they have charge of you. Don't give them a rough time. Do what they tell you to do. The women, you've noticed, bear the children. Their main responsibility is to look after the children and the house. That's ideal. He didn't burden them with leadership in that way. Now, there are people who, women who call themselves elders, but they're functioning in a very minor role. They're not really taking charge of anything. They may be just organizing. I'd rather call them deaconesses. That may be or may be not a, a biblical thing exactly, but it will do. However, we should pay respect to the fact that Paul doesn't burden the women with things that God didn't intend them to do. However, they can teach, they can prophesy in the sense of encouraging. We know that. I do not think the gifts uh, in Corinthians were given to men only. That's absurd. The women are to prophesy. That's to encourage and to teach under the supervision of male uh, leadership. Of course, that goes without saying. They're not to keep quiet and say nothing. That's simply wrong. They're not just to go home and ask their husbands. That's wrong. The text is almost certainly corrupted at that point. That's another subject. But Paul cannot, on the one hand, say all the gifts are given to the women and then tell them to shut up. That makes no sense at all. Women, in fact, in my experience in the Bible college, were often equally intelligent with the men, sometimes more conscientious, better theological minds than the men. However, that's not an issue. Balance the text, work it out, read the commentaries, F.F. Bruce and others, and you'll come, I think, to a very reasoned position on all of this. 
Okay, doc, we'll go to question. Uh, anyone watching, if you have any questions or you want to interact mm -hmm. on Zoom, uh, you can do so. Uh, communion, Anthony. Oh, yes. Nowhere does any apostle treat communion as being celebrated every single time the church meets. Why do you? Christ is the new Passover lamb, not the new weekly yes. well, lamb. That's, that's simply just wrong. Because Paul says, when you meet together as a church, that's his phrase, when you meet together in Ecclesia, as a church, you're not doing the Lord's Supper properly. Implying, of course, that they should be doing it. It doesn't have to be every week, every month, every three months, whatever. You make the choice. But it is not, I repeat, absolutely not a once a year. It's not the Passover all over again once a year. That text in, in Corinth is quite clear. When you meet together as a church, you're not doing it right. In Ecclesia, the text says. So that is church meetings, the Lord's Supper. It would have been a meal, a complete meal, no doubt. At the end, they would have broken bread and, and uh, offered a prayer of the wine and so on. This is not a problem. You make a choice as to half and you do it, but don't simply say it's a repeated annual Passover when it is not. Again, all the commentaries say this. One of the difficulties I'm feeling here is that people don't have access to a good theological library. It's very difficult. I don't blame them. But you really should descend upon a good theological library, Emory here, for instance. Join up with them and have access to some books, what I would call the great commentaries, the International Critical Commentary, the Cambridge Bible for Schools and, Pro uh, and Prophets, the best minds, the Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges, I should say clearly. The best minds in the business doesn't mean they're, they're infallible. But most people are not even aware of what they say. That's a limitation. If you have no training in the biblical languages, you are at some disadvantage. I don't say entirely because I'm not blaming anybody, but be careful. Don't overestimate your ability. None of us is infallible, of course. That goes without saying. But get some good learning before you make up your minds on some of these things. Consider what the great commentaries have said on it and then weigh those things carefully. Yeah, and um, nowadays it's becoming more and more difficult mm. not to be held accountable with this amazing technology. Absolutely. Uh, like this uh, system we're on right now being Absolutely. watched by hopefully many, yes. many people. Uh, right. One of the tools, uh, you mentioned the Cambridge um, Bible Hub yes. actually has a plethora. Yes. So if you click on Excellent. commentary up here. Mm -hmm. And it actually has the Cambridge. It That's has marvelous. marks. It has gills. Yes. A very famous. Absolutely. Uh, the pulpit, too. I see the pulpit, pulpit commentary. This right. is a mass of learning. So search them out. God has given us, in his mercy, this amazing technology that our forefathers would not dream of. This enables us to get, to the, to, to get access then to a great deal of very powerful minds who have devoted their lives to Bible study. I will say often they've been hampered by the traditional Trinitarian thinking. The fact was that if they bucked the creeds of the church fathers, they lost their jobs. Many of them were not courageous enough to do that. I think they could have. But you'll know that in John 10, Jesus is reported there as saying, or John is saying, many people believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they weren't saying anything very clearly for fear of being kicked out of the synagogue. Listen Cliff, carefully to the words of Jesus. If you're not willing to give up everything for me, even family, even job, forget it. You're not fit to be a disciple. That's what Jesus said. This is very radical. I don't particularly like that, but those are the words of Jesus. So what we do then is to do the best of what we have. In my case, I've spent 60 years doing this. And very badly, I may say, before that time in my Church of England days, I didn't know anything about anything. I was there, I'm not lying to you, didn't know anything. Then in my ignorance, I fell for the Armstrong movement where we were obligatory Sabbath keepers and we didn't eat pork and all that. This was simply wrong. We did not understand Paul at all. In the last uh, 50 years then, I've had a chance to try to review everything. Teaching in the classroom is very beneficial because you're hearing different points of view. I'm still listening carefully. But some of the questions we tend to get are not well thought out. They're things that could be searched easily on the internet even. But I'm so glad you're asking them. 
because it gives us a chance then to air possible answers for many people. Yeah, and uh, sometimes, yes, um, it's true that the, um, uh, and uh, we have um, uh, at least a thousand years of uh, orthodoxy, Catholic, Protestant, mm. Protestantism that has mired the uh, scholarship a little bit in relation to God and who God is and Jesus is. But yeah. sometimes you, you find uh, interesting things. I was just, uh, as I was presenting Bible Hub, Anthony, mm -hmm. uh, Cambridge uh, in Genesis 1. Yes. I just noticed this in relation to the word Elohim, in yes. the beginning Elohim, God. Mm. Uh, LXX, which is the Greek translation, ho theos, mm. the mm. God, Latin deos. Mm -hmm. And then look at this line here, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Concerning the Israelite conception of God, Elohim, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. learn, one, from the present verse, he yep. is a person. Of course. <laughs> so how did we get to three persons? <laughs> That's the issue that we want everybody oh, out there dear. listening tonight to get busy with and report back because it is patently obvious that the church fathers shifted the base from one God to a different one. This is serious business. We must return to the teaching of Jesus because the church... Sorry, folks, just a bit of a... Uh... Cutting out there a little bit. Yeah. Uh, are you there? Go ahead. Finish your... Well, yeah, my thought is simply this. Again, this is good history. If, you, if you're not convinced on this point, then I, I would recommend you read the book 300 and what is the title of it by uh, an author, historian? Uh, 381. Yes, yes, 381, 19. which is the Council of Constantinople. Read the history there and then read When Jesus Became God by Rubenstein. When Jesus Became God. And the other one is The Jesus Wars by Philip Jenkins. These are absolutely must-reads if you want to be informed. These are historians. They don't understand the Bible well always, but they very much know that the church fathers fought, struggled, argued. Thank you. There it is. Right there. Read it. Be absolutely sure to read it. And then The Jesus Wars by Philip Johnson. And When Jesus Became God by Rubenstein, whom we met. He's a Jewish historian. Without this information, and if people are not reading today, if they're simply playing with their little uh, machines all the time, I'm afraid they're losing the battle before they've started. You must read. You yeah, must this, read. Is, this is quite enjoyable. Uh, Jenkins is uh, one of the premier historians, by the Absolutely. way. And um, Absolutely. it's ironic that historians uh, are the most honest, I think, when it comes to this topic. Yes. I love the uh, subtitle, Anthony, how mm. four patriarchs, mm. three queens, Mm -hmm. And two emperors decided what Christians would believe for the next 1,500 years. Staggeringly <laughs> good. Brilliant. Then you ask your Methodist friends. Let's be quite specific here. Okay, please. Now you go to church, let's say, to your Methodist friends week by week. And in the creed that you recite week by week, you say, you believe that the Son was begotten, not made. What does that mean? I guarantee you will get a complete non-answer if you get an answer at all. I have no idea. Now, wait a minute. Is God and is Jesus pleased with you that you're muttering traditional things before God and man every Sunday without even knowing what you're saying? I say that's dangerous. You have a brain. You're supposed to be using it, but people are not. Group think, to quote the Tucker Carson phrase, has taken over big time in church. So, Invite your friends very gently to tell you what does it mean that Jesus was begotten, not made. That's in the creed. What it means is Jesus was eternally begotten. They don't know what that means either. He wasn't made. Well, that contradicts Scripture flat out because in Romans 1, Jesus is said to have come into existence from a woman, also in Galatians 4. He came into existence from a woman. He began to exist. So he was begotten. In time, not in eternity, he was made from a woman, came into existence from a woman. That is supremely, sublimely true, very easy. And don't forget that what you believe, rightly or wrongly, is affecting your whole psyche. It is not good for your health, mentally or otherwise, to believe things that are false. 
That's like putting cyanide in your coffee. Don't go there. Struggle for the truth. And not only just to get the truth so you can argue better, but get the truth in order to be saved. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. By all means, read the book that you kindly put up there, the book by Greg yeah, Geibel. I was going to say, there, there's just too many books out there mm. to still be in the dark about Absolutely. These, the subject at, at hand, the Trinity yes. and the doctrine. And That's there's right. just too much information out there. Uh, mm. Jesus Wars, 381. Mm. I mean, any standard history book, commentary, Catholic or evangelical, they, they have to fess up as we say, <laughs> they have to come clean. I mean, yes. and, and to be in the dark about this, folks, really. Uh, no excuse. I, it actually requires more doing to be in the dark about this. Than, yes. <laughs> okay, Anthony, let's uh, push along okay. here. What else we got? What is the difference between the terms ha-ares mm. and tebel? Tevel. Uh, yes. tevel. tevel. We have a yeah. couple of psalms there, so let yeah. me put the psalms up here for us yeah let's see um psalm 89 11 the heavens are yours the earth i yes. guess that's Hazer, is mm. also yours the world and all it contains you have founded mm. and then psalm 96 yeah. 13 before the lord no note the caps yeah. god for he is coming he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness. So yes. is there any difference there between no, the words? No, absolutely not. You, I happened to look this up before I started. These are practical synonyms. The Bible has synonyms. English has synonyms. There's no central difference. Tevil would be, if anything, more organized society, thinking of the people. Aretz is earth or land. Relax. Enjoy. No essential difference. The lexicon which you should use if you can read Hebrew, Brown Drive and Briggs lexicon, it's on the software. No difference. It's the same sort of thing. These are virtually synonymous things, as happens in all language. There's really no, no major difference. Nothing to be gained by struggling for a difference there. So the tabel, the world, yeah. it's uh, sometimes it's, it's used for society. Of, yeah. Right. Tevel. Tevel is organized Tevel. society, okay. and uh, earth and land are slightly bigger terms, if you like, but they are often synonyms. Any lexicon will show you that. Um, any um, particular verse you might remember where it's, it, it means more society than the, phys the actual physical world? Um, no, but it wasn't the ones that you had there. Society is organized it's ecumenic in Greek. Okay. The inhabited earth, people in it. But really, I mean, the difference is so fine. It doesn't matter. I'm tempted to use the political phrase that became known. You know, what's the difference? What's the matter? What matters is that you get out there and teach your friends who God is. That's the essential thing. The rest can be looked up in any dictionary, and they are, as the lexicon says, poetic synonyms. There's no essential difference. It wouldn't make a hill of beans difference if you found a difference. So right. don't bother. Okay. Um, let's see. We're coming to the end of the questions. If anyone mm. else has any questions, please uh, yeah. type them in. If you're yeah. on Facebook or on Zoom, if you want to join us live, uh, go ahead and click the raise hand mm. button. Here's another question that you might find superfluous. Yeah. yeah. But uh, let's go with it. <laughs> I agree with your uh, Christology. Yeah. But I fail to see why mm. play why play along with Jesus is God proponents mm -hmm. in capitalizing Son. Mm. This started with uh, Trinitarian versions like the Geneva Bible, mm. perpetuated by the Rhymes, 1582. Yep. Uh, interestingly, the earlier Protestant versions, such as Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthews, did not. Yeah, it's a good, it's a fair point. Uh, in our New Testament, I'm doing the second edition of my One God the Father, One Man Messiah translation of the New Testament. We already have taken the capital L off Lord for Jesus, which looks odd, but it gets the point over. Yes, it's an editorial decision. One could take the capital S off Son. I don't think that will change the world, quite honestly, but 
yeah, when you do your translation, you may want to do that. It's a valid point. Uh, the reason why um, you, you, you have uh, changed the one with the Lord issue, mm. can, can you just tell us why? So yes. basically you're saying you don't like to capitalize L when it comes to Lord Jesus or Lord Christ. I've made that editorial decision because we're trying to stress the difference in the two Lords. It's a catastrophe to say that Jesus is the Lord God. And so to bring that to the attention of the reader all the time, we have simply chosen to write Lord with a little L when referring to Jesus. It's an editorial decision that people might make in different ways, but I think it's possibly useful, probably useful. But that's Psalm 110 one. Yahweh speaks to Adonai. Again, strong concordance is hiding from you. You are, you are at the mercy of uh, textbooks sometimes. You're at the mercy of your translation. In the beginning was the word. You're falling right into the hands of the Trinitarians when you put a capital W on there. Let me tell you about that. In the beginning was the word. That's little w. Logos is not capital anything. Word is word. Your word is not another person from you, nor is it in John 1. The word word has occurred massively in the Old Testament as davar and so on and Memra in the Aramaic. It's a word, W-R-D, a self-expression. In the beginning, that self-expression was, and it was with God. That's not what you say in English. When were you last with your word? It's nonsense. How are you not reading English, American English? You're reading Hebraic thinking here. The idiom in Hebrew is that have something with you means it's very close to you, it's in respect of you, it unpacks who you are. You, as a man thinks in the Proverbs, so is he. You are what you think. You are your word. And so John 1, 1 C says, Theosinologos. I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation. Theosinologos means the word was God underlined. The emphatic position there. Literally, God was the word. No need to translate it that way. The sense is the word was God and not somebody else. God is his word. Now that word, that self-expression of God, eventually became embodied in a human being uniquely in John 1.14. That's easy. I'd leave that alone. A false translation. Sometimes, certainly not in every verse, 99.9% of every translation is correct, but there are certain key points where they're promoting the church fathers who on their own admission had given up the Shema. And in the introduction to my translation, I've got some wonderful quotations showing how a new religion began. What if you've inherited that new religion? What if the church fathers departed company? I believe they did with Jesus because they deliberately said, we don't believe in that Jewish Shema. We don't want that. That's not going to win any converts. That's not going to be popular. But what if it's the truth? Because God gave his oracles to the Jews. And salvation, Jesus said in John 4, 22, is of the Jews. Get that. You better fall in love with the Jews in that regard, not what they've done with faith now. But as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, that's your basis. Jesus was a Jew. Mary was a Jew. Jesus was descended uh, physically as, as a lineage from David. If he's not the son of David, he's not the Messiah. He's also the seed of the woman. Yes, I get it. But in the Bible, patri patrilineage is right. You get your, your uh, nationality to your father. That's right. You've noted that Jesus was an exception. Didn't have a human father. The seed of the woman is announced early on. That means the descendant, the lineal, uh, lineage by lineage, by natural lineage, descendant of Eve is Jesus. He's also the son of David. Uh, so. That's not hard. It was not meant to be hard. Luke 2, 11 says that the Messiah Lord has been born there. That's his birth certificate. Certainly not God. Um, just to, um, uh, some translations do share the little L, mm. uh, reflecting the Greek, actually, Kiriomu. Yes, Kiriosmu. Kiriomu. Uh, Kiriomu, to my Lord. Mm -hmm. ERV and the yep. EHV, which is right. 
what is that english heritage version okay interesting uh has false capital is huge there well, if you have a capital l on your second lord you're being deceived by the translators it's funny because it has it in the text uh yeah. my lord there you see yes so the second lord in verse one is not one of the divine names that are usually rendered lord or lord good the coming noun for lord it does yes. re it does refer to christ but as a description not a title hmm. it's interesting it's really both it's both the description and it's a title my lord doesn't matter the they're getting on the right good. track they're correct about the word of course yeah the first part of this footnote was very good Excellent. but then it's perfect like, very very good all right uh we got steve who wants to have a chat here yep mm -hmm. and um let's just punch him up and then um we'll see mm. steve hello hello man. hi carlos how are you doing hey how are you i know the you accent <laughs> yes hi sir anthony Hey, good to hear you from New Zealand, I believe, or is it Australia? Yes, yes, we've been away a bit busy, but we just thought we'd slip in on this meeting. It's good. Good. Wonderful. Um, yeah, the question um, I found is an interesting one with respecting non believers yep. because they, they feel they have a ticket uh, in not having faith in God with respect to the fact that um, there's been so many atrocities and terrible things done to innocent people like children and. Yeah. All the cruelties over the years, and yeah. they, and their argument is, well, you know, if he's if such a powerful God and loving, why hasn't he stepped in and, and done something about it? And and that's that's their reason for not having yeah. faith and, and yeah. so forth, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, it's a good question to uh, to, to have yeah. to answer. Yeah. Um, my my thoughts was this, and I I, I don't know, but mm. is it to do with the fact that God is in His day of rest? Like, um, you know, we know that uh, Jesus gave the illustrations about the master. He could refer to himself, but then he is God's agent anyway. But yep. he leaves a plot of land like a vineyard or something in charge of some tenants to look after. Yep. It's just one that comes to mind. Exactly. And he goes abroad, he goes abroad, and then he comes back at a certain time to find these ones uh, that are not looking after things properly and so forth, you know. <laughs> so um, I'm just sort of thinking, um, is, is this, what, what's, what's the answer to this day of rest? What does this mean, uh, Anthony? Is it because he is sort of, uh, sort of away at this point and yes. uh, that's why he hasn't stepped in at this point? Well, he says that, and I'm, that's a great question. He says twice in Isaiah, I don't know the verses, I have kept silent for a long time. That's God speaking. Hmm. He has patently. We're not living in apostolic times. Obviously, there are no apostles at the level of the 12 now. I'll tell you why. To be an apostle with capital A, like the 12, you have to have seen Jesus, and you and I have not. He showed up to Paul. He showed up to numbers of people and then stopped doing that. That's a huge change. Nor do we have the accrediting signs and wonders of apostles. We don't. As I translate the book of Acts again recently, it's astonishing to me what went on there. For example, when they lied about the price of a piece of land they'd sold, the first the husband came in and lied, and when he lied to Peter, he fell dead, collapsed and died right there. And then uh, the wife came along and lied in the same way, and she fell dead. When Paul was obstructed by the man on the island of Cyprus, who was spoiling uh, Paul's presentation of the gospel, Paul turned to that man and said, you enemy of all truth, you son of the devil, be blind for three days. I don't see anything like that today. So it's a handoff policy. I can understand that. God is allowing things to work. The world is surely going to learn a lesson eventually from the chaos and confusion that in the church and the world we've produced, which unbelievable degree of error, and mistake and sinfulness yes i can only think that god has allowed free will though to run its own way and we are going to learn our lesson big time however when jesus comes back he's going to say this bring my enemies who didn't want me to be king over them bring my enemies and slaughter them in my presence jesus said that so vengeance is coming i will repay 
don't take vengeance into your own hands now. Wait for God, and he'll sort all this out. But yes, the degree of evil is horrible. I agree with that. On the other hand, the alternative not to believe in God is worse than stupid, beyond unimaginable, because then you're saying that all of this happened with no mind behind it. So that's the best answer I can give. What would you like to add to that? Yes. Well, thank you. That's, that's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Kels. Eva, all, all our best. Um, yes. Let's see. We have... Actually, uh, just in reference to that, Anthony, uh, mm. I was just looking here. So the text I put up on the screen about God being silent, yes. Isaiah 42:14. Well done. Good. Uh, for a long time, I have kept silent. There's also um, Psalm 50:21. I remained yep. silent, and you thought I didn't care. Ah, and good point. There's an interesting one here in Isaiah 29. Mm -hmm. about the day of, it sounds like the day of the Lord, mm -hmm. you will be punished with sun, thunder, etc. Yep. And then it talks about uh, be delayed and wait, blind yourselves and be blind. Yes. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, yes. but not with strong drink. Right. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. Yep. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your heads. Yes. Sears. Then you hand the book to the literate, the learned, and he said, I don't know what this is about. <laughs> and you hand the book to the illiterate, the unlearned, and he doesn't know. Correct. That strikes me as being very much like where we are with thousands of denominations all unable to agree. The Bible was not meant to be so badly misunderstood. And verse 13, a very, um, very sad state here because these people yes. draw near with their words. Mm. Honor me with their lip service, yes. but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence or fear for me yes. consists of tradition. So Learn that's why heart. we are in the situation we are now. All right, yes. just before we end here, we have one from Facebook. Mm. Your Facebook here, David Williams. Could it mm. be that John one fourteen, the word became yeah. flesh, yeah. is referring to the baptism of Jesus? since the following verse is about the baptizer making oh. his proclamation of of mm -hmm. Jesus and let me yeah no, I, I don't, that. Just don't think that's necessary he didn't he didn't become flesh the word did not become flesh at the baptism of Jesus I don't think that's right the easiest way that creates less argument I think is that John 1 1 is a reference to Genesis it's exactly the same so that word then eventually showed up in the person of Jesus, who was at the age of 12, a Mozart of theology. And of course, later on, he was baptized by John. And don't forget that Jesus also baptized many people. He actually didn't do the dunking himself, his agents did, that's wonderful. But water baptism, let's finish with this, is absolutely mandated by the New Testament. Acts 8, 12, I was telling the students just recently, is a brilliant, brilliant text. Acts 8, 12, when they believe Philip preaching the gospel of the kingdom and everything concerning Jesus, then they were ready to be baptized in water, both men and women. Don't ever imagine that that is less than required of you. Water baptism is one of those absolutely non-negotiable facts required for obedience and obedience is the key to salvation. Hebrews 5, 9, you can do it with your children, with your family every day. Hebrews 5, 9, salvation is given to those who delightfully and humbly obey Jesus. So don't start by shaking your fist at Jesus and refusing to believe in water baptism. That is a very serious mistake. Right. So we'll leave it there, folks. Mm. Thank you for all of you out there. Wonderful. Yep. And um, I'll just leave you with, so we should be back in a couple of weeks, hopefully. We, we're thank trying you. to do this by bi weekly. Mm -hmm. Marvelous. Thank you, Carlos. So thanks, everyone. Um, and I'll leave you with this, uh, this little uh, advice from Scripture. Uh, steer clear from those who, like the enemy, while you sleep, Plant weeds among mm. the wheat, then slips away. Mm. 
So until next time, folks, thanks very much. Keep the faith. Yeah, thank you. And keep preaching the gospel Absolutely. in the name of Jesus.